just so appreciate uh, just what we've got to enjoy so far in this conference. And I want to start off by reading uh, a little story about a minister traveling to a conference in Windsor via London and being stopped by a policeman. And the policeman stopped him, and I think he had been speeding, and opening up the window, the policeman recognizes just the smell of alcohol on his breath, and he says, sir, have you been drinking? And um, he's not a, he is like any good Church of the Nations pastor, and he says, no, I'm driving, I wouldn't do such a thing while I'm practicing that. He says, I've just been having water. And the policeman says, well, then why do I smell wine? And the, mon- the minister, with shock and a bit of surprise, looks at the bottle and says, good Lord, he's done it again. There's a reason why I share that, and we'll pick up on it a little bit later. But I do want to thank you all for making time to be here today to celebrate with Leanne and I as we celebrate our 24th wedding anniversary. And it's a naturally supernatural thing that I remember that when she didn't. So, happy anniversary, sweetie. Don't worry, my top... Legally it was today. We're being legal... Celebrations tomorrow. And so my topic is, the best is yet to come. And we're looking at naturally supernatural, but this is a slogan that's on Harvest Wall. And you've heard a little bit of the journey that we're transitioning into a new season. Uh, But at the end of last year, I just felt the Lord highlighting what was just a trendy slogan on our wall. And I suddenly realized it was shifting into becoming a prophetic invitation and a call that we get to step into. Not just Leanne and I as we move on a new journey, but on harvest and just what the Lord has in store. Because in the kingdom, we, we come into destiny, we all come into the more. We all come into spacious, favored places full of grace and God's goodness. And so I feel there's something for us as we are naturally walking supernaturally where he's leading us into better things. We have a kingdom that's come that's phenom- phenomenal. But let me tell you, it's coming in greater measure until it's ultimately consummated with the returning king. And so we get to live optimistic in all that he is. Really, it's just faithful. And so uh, that is the title. And if you are not living with that expectation and anticipation in your hearts, well, then maybe you'll be like this little chap, if we can go to the next slide. The top, it's a meme. It says, enjoy it. These are are the best years of your life. And he's got a bit of tears and shock. And he's saying, this is the best. And so that is living naturally stressed. When we're wanting to live naturally supernatural, live in that and lead out of that place. And so we're going to go to church on a Saturday if you're ready. We're going to jump into the scripture a little bit. And if you've got your Bibles, you can go to John chapter 2 verse 1. Uh, I will put it up on the screens for those who don't have them. But just to, to set the context, these people had been waiting for the miraculous to break out for over 400 years. They haven't seen a miracle. They believe there's better to come, that there's promise, and they are waiting. It's a little bit like, and I need to apologize in this, but if you're an English rugby supporter, and 2003 you won the World Cup, but 2007 and 2019 and 2024, these South Africans are just keeping the trophy. And you can be waiting. We've, we've heard wonderful... <laughs> We've heard wonderful, sto- uh, not stories, just testimonies of what God's done through the years and through revivals and reformations and renaissance and, and people who have just poured out their lives for Jesus. And you can wait in that or you can step into it. I love that phrase, you know, we can wait for revival, pray for revival or say, Lord, we are called to be revival and we're going to step out naturally and see supernatural things happen because you are with us. And so in John 2 verse 1, we see the first recorded miracle and over four centuries that are taking place. And it's that miracle that reveals something, and even as I told that joke about the new wine, and Jesus coming and doing something in a natural moment that's transformative and positions them in newness that is a prophetic declaration to the fullness of the promise that they're going to inherit. And so all of that's starting to happen, and Jesus arrives, and the party has gone a little bit excessive, because way ahead of schedule, they have finished all the wine. And Jesus doesn't arrive in a passive, aggressive state to reprimand them like a policeman pitching up, looking through the window and saying, is that wine? I'm bringing strong coffee. No, what Jesus does is he brings 150 gallons of fine wine. That is 757 bottles of wine that he provided. And I think religion has tainted the lens through which we see Jesus. 
and we start to think maybe he's withholding and we've got to try and wrestle with his reluctance rather than taking hold of his willingness. And there's something of his heart that he loves to, he loves to go to parties. He loves to throw parties. He is the party. And he's invited us to an eternal party. And so there's something about knowing the best is yet to come. Why don't you turn to someone next to you and say the best is yet to come. Now, I know you saved it for the next person that you initially ignored, but why don't you turn to the other person and say the best is yet to come. Now, in this account, the book of John, we see him referring, we see him referring to this miracle as a sign, not just a miracle. And a sign is a miracle that teaches us something, but also imparts something to us. It doesn't just astonish us, just amaze us, but imparts something to us and reveals something that the Lord is wanting us to be aware of. So what's being imparted in this moment? What's Jesus wanting us to encounter? Now we need to know that Jesus is stepping into this moment, naturally thinking he's going with the disciples to a wedding. He will say, this isn't my time yet, but he is ready for the supernatural to invade and divine intervention to take place and to be the outworking of that convergence at any moment. That's what we're going to see uh, unfold as we read this a little bit further. John 2, 1 to 11. Jesus change, uh, changes water into wine. Verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. On the third day. We see that mentioned all throughout Scripture. What's happening, what Jesus is doing in this moment, is he's uh, about to step into a prophetic enactment of what he's going to accomplish, and we celebrated last weekend at Easter. And this is happening this, this foreshadowing of the future story and its culmination is happening in this first story moment unfolding. Verse 2, And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Verse 4, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. I want to say that my mom wanted to be at this conference, but she's in Australia and if you know my mother, she would have been loving yesterday evening. She would have been rolling around, joining in the handstands and the cartwheels. She has broken her ankle, jumping off harvest stage, which is only about that high. But she's only about that high. But I, I, I feel something with Jesus here, because if you've led a church with your mom in the church, and she mothers in a certain way, there are moments that you want to say, woman, why do you involve me? Now, I know we can get a little bit nervous when we hear this. And you can think, Jesus, Jesus, you can't talk to your mom that way. And maybe there's some mothers who are feeling a little bit affirmed in this moment because your child has been speaking with a little bit of sass back to you. And you think, well, if the Son of God could do that, then maybe my child's going to be okay. <laughs> Is this love? Joking. Um, but... In the culture and what's happening, that wasn't really a derogatory term, but there is something about Jesus saying, I'm going to be about my father's business, and this isn't my time. And yet there's something about Mary, which I love, because he's giving a little bit of pushback. But Mary doesn't even acknowledge the pushback. I love that. There's something about a mom where she says, I'm just going to press forward. It's not a persistent widow. It's a resolute mother that knows her child that she's raised, who he is, what's possible with him, the potential. And there's something that says, I know something about this man, that if you are willing to press in, if you are willing to keep seeking, if you're going to keep pitching up and going after him, he's going to come after you wholeheartedly, any moment, any time, anywhere, even when it doesn't seem it is the timing, he makes time. And so he steps into the moment. And this is what she says, and I love it, and it's the word for us today. If you're wanting to know how to live naturally, supernaturally, the best leadership advice I can give you, if you're taking notes, write this down. Verse 5, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. If you want to live naturally, supernatural, live attentive to the voice of the one who is speaking the miraculous into being in every moment. He is singing songs. He is working um, a poetic outworkings in situations. My wife was, uh, Leanne, was in the first, well, in the worship in the first session, she got an SMS from a lady named Angel that she had met a couple years back in a shopping line in... Um, Durban, South Africa, and this lady, she just felt that she was in need. And so she gave her, she only had 200 rand at that time, Leanne, and gave her 200 rand. 
And this lady took her details. She was blown away. She said, you don't know how much you need this and how far it'll go for us. Anyway, we're just a naturally supernatural moment. She then started coming to harvest. And as I say, she had been in a hard place. But favor started to just follow her and grace. And she moved to Cape Town and she stepped into new opportunities. And she just messaged Leanne. We haven't seen her for a while. But she messaged us this morning saying, I've just achieved my PhD. How, how beautiful is that? And we're stepping into a new moment. You know, we've been part of Harvest for 30 years, and we've been uh, on the team for 21 years, and leading in a transition to full leadership role for 16 years. And in that, when you, you feel the shift is coming up, it can be quite nerve-wracking. You can think, what am I doing? And let me tell you, two to four in the morning, I'm waking up thinking, what am I doing regularly? And then when my sanity comes and I remind myself of what the Lord said, there's, there's excitement and anticipation for what's ahead. But here's the thing, I can't reason by what I'm feeling. I've got to reason and I've got to outwork purpose by what he's saying. And you've got to do whatever he tells you. And so that is the encouragement there. Verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. And the best is yet to come. And so as you read this passage, you could see, hang on a moment, because the credit should be going to Jesus. Maybe in leadership moments, you felt that there's things that you've built and done where credit has fallen on others that should be coming to you. But this is never the heart of Jesus. He's not looking for credit. He's not looking for pedestal or platform. He's not even looking for a pulpit. He's going to use wherever he's situated to display the splendor and the goodness of God. And so here in this moment, what he is looking to do is just say, I'm stepping into a moment where naturally it's about a groom. I'm going to add my super to his natural, and the outworking is going to be a display of my glory that will reveal me through him and be distinct about him. And so then we go to verse 11 and says, what did Jesus, what Jesus did here? And Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he received his glory. And his disciples believed in him. If you're holding on to something where maybe you feel a little bit bitter or offended, I want to say release that so the Lord can reveal his glory, that transformation can happen and that you can be a display of his grace for others. Don't try and hold to get the glory. Just let it be released because Jesus will always give due reward where it is due. And so this passage, this miracle, Jesus uses to show something. And what's happening here in this moment and this miracle taking place is this, available transformation. Won't you say that with me? Available transformation. There is transformation available for all of us here today, for anyone who seeks them and will find them. Jesus wants to bring transformation to this nation. Jesus wants to bring transformation to your nation. He wants to bring transformation to your city. He wants to bring transformation to your church, to your neighborhood, to your family, to your leadership, to everywhere you're involved. He wants to bring transformation. And you get to be a part of it, and his glory gets revealed through it. So I want to just bring five observations through this text that we've just read. And the first one is this. I don't know how you arrived at this conference but I want to give you a leadership principle that's going to set you up to, to go forward boldly. And it's this, number one, our emptiness equals God's opportunity. Our emptiness equals God's opportunity. And so this wedding was one of the biggest events of the year. In that day, in that age, in that culture, it would be thrown for friends and family and neighbors and everyone would come and you would get to host this moment that would set up a real honor for those around you. And if you're inviting everyone, like at this conference, and that buffet breakfast wasn't serving everyone, and you got there and there wasn't enough for you, there's shame that would come on the organizers and the facilitators and those that were doing it and leading it. Can we just thank the team that have been administrating? That's been phenomenal being here. But if, you, if it wasn't done well, there's dishonor that comes, and there's embarrassment that comes socially. Not just in a moment and we think we'll go home next week, no, but it would last for a time and there would be the sense of uh, we couldn't actually do what we needed to do. There wasn't enough available. 
the moment fall short. And it will be a hard position and a tough position to be in. I don't know if anyone's experienced uh, those sort of moments. We, we had Alpha, Nicky Gumbel, he was the leader. We had our Alpha dinner last year and I was working with our administrator and we had uh, set everything up and everyone arrived for dinner and I said to her, um, but where's the dinner? And she realized we had booked the dinner for the next day. And so let me tell you, we had amazing pizzas that night that uh, we changed the format of Alpha. But here, yeah, there's a desperation. There's a sense in this moment that things aren't going well and there's no one to turn to. And how many times have you felt like that? Just not enough. You don't have enough resource. You don't have enough capacity. You don't have enough wisdom. You don't have enough anointing. You don't have enough gifting. You feel I'm not enough for the moment. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm, I'm out of resource. People are talking at me, but I can't even hear them and compute what they're saying. I'm running away on the inside. I've got no energy left for these relationships because I'm feeling so empty. I've used all of the creativity I can muster. There's nothing more I can apply in terms of strategy to the situation. I am done and I am done through. Even in my finances, I've come to the end of me. Have you ever been in a place like that? And the encouragement that comes as we're looking at this story is this. If they hadn't run out of the good wine, they would have never got to taste the best wine. Your emptiness doesn't mean that there is an opportunity for God's goodness and lavishness and extravagance to be made empty. And here's the thing. We've heard stories where maybe people are in the middle of the muddle of what they're going through. But the reality is this, he always saves the best wine for redemptive stories. He always saves the best for when he can step in and turn around and bring something out of it that we would never have ex expected. And Tolkien describes this, since we're in England, Tolkien des describes this as a eucatastrophe. Turn to someone next to you and say, eucatastrophe. No, I never said, say, you're a catastrophe. <laughs> it's eucatastrophe. That's how it's spelt up there. This is what it means, a good catastrophe. It means a massive turn in fortune from a seemingly unconquerable situation to an unforeseen victory, usually brought about by grace rather than heroic effort. I got to walk through Windsor Castle and see um, swords and knights and uh, people who had been honored on the walls. And I thought, you know what? Uh, you've got to work hard to achieve those things. But there's something we can achieve by grace. Where even where we thought we were going to lose the battle, but the victory is ours. Not through heroic effort, but because of the grace of God at work. Even in the 11th hour moment where we feel there's nothing left, but the best is yet to come. Matthew 5 verse 3 in the message. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. I want to encourage some of you that feel at the end of your rope. When you've come to the end of your rope, there is more of God. His rule, his reign the kingdom's advancement and the richness and resource thereof that's available to you, not because of where you're at, but because where he's at and he's called you to be with him. Number two, Jesus always uses what's available. Here, we, we see him turning water into wine. We see in other stories, he takes a little boy's lunch and he feeds 15 to 20,000 people, including the woman and the children. You think that's a naturally supernatural moment where something just happens unplanned for, but that uh, is divinely orchestrated to cater for the crowd. And you think, did Jesus operate naturally, supernaturally? Was it the disciples as they were distributing and the multiplication happened? Was the little boy the one who operated naturally, supernaturally, bringing the lunch? I want to say that there was a mother most likely at home who just naturally went around honoring the gift that God had given her, making a lunch, and he put a super on that natural to position her child for his destiny. And we're hearing about it today. In John 9, we see him take a little bit of mud and a little bit of spit, and he meets a blind man. And you think, well, that just looks natural with a bit of supernatural. But there was more taking place. Jesus was revealing himself through that because he was just saying, even as the creator who took the dust of the earth and formed you from it, even though there's a little, uh, there's a little a situation not outworking how I'd planned, so I'm going to take a little bit more dust and spit, and I'm just going to finish off what I started. And he's revealing who he is even in the midst of that moment. And so we come to this and we see that Jesus takes jugs filled with water and he uses it to do something miraculous. He will take it, he will remake it, he will multiply it, and he will pour it out. Whatever you bring to him, he takes it, he will remake it, he will multiply it, and he will pour it out. Doesn't matter how much, doesn't matter how little. And here we see something phenomenal happening. He is taking water and he is changing the molecular makeup of it. 
Don't know if you're, if you're a preacher with the illustration, you put a little bit of coloring in and change the water to wine, or to red, should I say. I won't be doing that today. That's not what he's doing. He's changing the molecular makeup of water. He's superseding the aging process, which normally takes 10 to 20 years to make fine wine, and in one moment, with a word, he changes the atomic structure of the liquid. I love that. He didn't just remake a liquid. What he does in this moment is he perfected a wine to flawlessly match the moment. He perfected a wine to flawlessly match the moment in overflow. And so when he steps in supernaturally into your natural, his super on your natural, John Wimber described that as the, the excluded middle. We often live in reason or in mysticism. There's an excluded middle, a convergence point, where the supernatural and natural come together, and that's where we call to live from. And so when this happens here, and the operating out of the excluded middle, it always flawlessly, perfectly matches the moment and overflow more than enough. Man, I could end the sermon right here. It's a sermon. I should be bringing a more uh, leadership principles, but I just love this text, and I think there's something in it that's going to impart something to us more than just... Uh, a couple leadership principles I could bring out because we're following his leading, his voice, and the display of his goodness. And so if you feel less, here's the thing. His resources are never limited by yours. His resources are never limited by ours. Point three, are you ready? Point three, got to speed it up. Jesus is establishing a new kingdom normal. Jesus is establishing a new kingdom normal. And he says some curious things here. And he says some strange things here. Verse 6. Nearby stood six water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. He wasn't saying go and get water from the bar section or the buffet section or those little uh, dispensers we've been seeing out in the halls. No, he says there are six stone jars. I want you to get each of those six, uh, six stone jars, each of them, don't leave any, and bring them here. There's something so significant about this moment. Because what would happen is they would have come here and any good Pharisee would have known I needed to be cleansed and I needed to be purified. I'd wash my hands before eating anything and as I entered as a show of hospitality, you would pour out of those gallons and wash my feet and that would be what you would do to host me well. So I would be pure and cleansed. And Jesus says, bring everything that's being used for purification and cleansing. Bring those stone jars. And he is going to do something miraculous in a moment that's going to change the content within. So it's going to no longer be about what people can do to practice purification and cleansing. But it's going to be a new covenant outworking of what the wine of the Spirit looks like that we wash by when we live and walk in grace. He says, I'm going to turn the situation around. And he takes those jars and he performs that miracle. And Hebrews 10 verse 9 sums this up. Jesus was saying, my time is not yet, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a prophetic enactment of what the fullness of time will look like through what I've done for my people. And Hebrews 10 verse 9 says, the regulations were imposed until a time of reformation. And Jesus is prophesying here through this miracle, and he's saying, I am the, re uh, the reformation, I am the revival, I am the renaissance, I am the timed outworking of God's best. And there's the best in me, but the best is yet to come because it's ever increasing. And so Jesus is displaying this through the moment and on who he is and what he's doing. And I love that normally they would use wineskins. But here he is using these, these stone uh, jars. And uh, six of them, six represents the number of man. Stone often speaks about when you look at the inference of, of the law. But he's using it to display grace in this moment. And what he's saying to you is, even if you come and you cracked and you beaten, you broken, you feel like you hardened like stone, he's saying, I'm going to do something in you that's going to be effervescent, that's going to change the very expression of what you carry, that will no longer be a religious act, but it'll be a sign of celebration, feasting, and prophetic fulfillment, fulfillment to come. That's what I'm going to do if you will just come. And 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. Sorry, I get excited. Am I speaking fast in my South African accent? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. If you feel like you may be a vessel today that's been a bit cracked and not fit for purpose, he doesn't discard the vessel. He always redeems, he always restores, he always chooses us as we are and meets us in that place. And he always does what only he can do, works through the imperfections. And even when we come and we've got our own brokenness and own vanity and our own ideas, and he still chooses us, even when we don't choose ourselves or when we elevate ourselves and no longer choose him. He always chooses us and he wants to do his miraculous in and through. 
And so maybe you're overwhelmed with responsibilities. Maybe you're in that place where you're feeling inadequate, as I've mentioned, or mediocre, and you're not enough. And he wants to bring full transformation to you. And if you're in that place where you're saying, no, I'm, I'm living and leading and fully vital. I, I love what Tony has shared before. I, I don't need to pray for revival because I can't say it like you do. I'm like Mark. I'm going to get this wrong. But something about embers and I'm already alive. I don't need to be revived. Huh? I'll let you say it. But we get to be that for others. Pope Francis says this, and I think it's the only time I've quoted him, but he says, God always seeks out the peripheries. Those who have run out of wine, those who drink only of discouragement, like that little picture of that little chap we saw earlier. Jesus feels their weakness in order to pour out the best wine for those who, for whatever reason, feel that all their jars have been broken. He feels your weakness. He feels where you're at. He feels where you feel insufficient and inadequate. He feels that so he can pour out the best wine into that situation. And sometimes we are that clay vessel. We always are, actually, that he wants to display and pour out his excellency through as we touch the forgotten peripheries of society. And he wants to do something in us that's effervescent, overflowing, so it can spill out and wash out on the many. Number four, Jesus shows his power to those who serve and are willing to look foolish. John, your message inspired me. I'm not going to do a headstand, but it definitely inspired me. He shows his power to those who serve and are willing to look foolish. I mean, this seems like an absurd obstruction that Mary gives to do what Jesus says, because they're saying, take those purification jars, take the water, and offer it for the tasting of the master of the ceremony. And you would think the servants would think, this is crazy. This is our boss. We're going to lose our employment. But they go and do exactly what Jesus says and full obedience, carrying it out exactly as was said to them. And there are moments in faith where you have to do the ridiculous if you want to experience the miraculous. There are moments in faith where you've got to do the ridiculous if you want to experience the miraculous. If you want to push beyond the natural, you've got to take that natural step, but in obedience, so the supernatural breaks in and breaks through through you. It's that thing of divine intervention that you're inviting and making space for. When was the last time you did something ridiculous in faith? Here's the thing. Action isn't the goal. Obedience is. You can get in trouble with action. If I go back to harvest or visit people in different churches and I start doing headstands and rolling around and, I mean, I might be damaging people. I might be robbing them of the moment of experiencing the beauty of what Jesus is wanting to do because I'm putting on a show or going back to an old formula of what was wrote. But there's something about being sensitive to the prompting. Louis called it the nudging and saying, you know, I'm going to be fully and, and undignified. I'm going, to, I'm going to not try and find dignity in and of myself, but in the beauty of carrying out the master's instruction. And so there's something about obedience that is beautiful. So you pause. You pray, and when you feel the nudging of the Spirit, you go for it. And I, and I love this instruction that was given to them. Fill the jars. They were just told, fill the jars. What would you do? I need to leave a bit about that much, so when I pour it, it's, got, it's not going to spill everywhere. But it says this, they filled them to the brim. They did what he said to the brim. Listen, if Jesus has called you to serve, serve to the brim. If he's called you to lead, lead to the brim. If he's called you to preach, preach to the brim. Lead worship to the brim. Administer to the brim. Love to the brim. Love to the place of fullness that people encounter, his goodness spilling over the edges. And the beauty is this. When you do it to the brim, God blesses. And he never blesses just to the brim. It's always overflow. Because in the kingdom, we're not a pessimistic, the glass is half empty, or optimistic, the glass is half full. We're a people of the cup that is always overflowing. Amen? Number five. I'm way more excited than the rest of you. <laughs> that is fine. Number five. This is my best point. Jesus always comes when you invite him. Verse two. Jesus was invited to the wedding. The miracle became possible because of a simple invite. And you know, we, we pray and we've done a chair where we say, Holy Spirit, we welcome you and we invite you to come. And you know, theologically, we know that he's already omnipresent. But there's something beautiful about doing it because what we're actually saying is, in this moment, I'm intentionally making myself present to your presence. And so I'm going to remove every obstacle. I'm going to open myself wholeheartedly. I'm going to push everything out the way because I'm inviting you to come not just into a room, 
but into my mentality, into my emotions, into the soulish realm, and to every aspect of my spiritual life, I'm inviting you to come. And I make myself available to that. Revelations 3.20, he stands knocking. And the beauty is, as you look through the Gospels, is this, every time Jesus is invited, he pitches up every time, everywhere, every place, 100% of the time. It's not always in our timing, it's always in his timing, and he makes beautiful everything in its time. He always pitches up when there's the invitation. And so we're going to, after the next session, we're going to um, share in communion. I bought this from South Africa. It's my little uh, um, miracle meal. That's what we call them. And uh, Jesus with the disciples, he takes this moment and he says, this cup is a cup of my blood. Now they would have known that it's wine, but they also know this is a man who's turned water into wine. And so when he says, this is a cup of my blood poured out for you for forgiveness, they attentive that even though it seems a natural moment, something supernatural and transformative can take place. And he's leading them in something. And so they, they are fully aware that this isn't the normal moment. And this is why it's, they're aware of this, that the one who turned water into wine turned an ordinary cup of wine into a bottomless glass of grace. What can he do if we come in faith to what he's wanting to do? The point is this. And the naturally supernatural of what the Lord is wanting to lead and carry you forward into, to have impact and influence for his glory to be revealed and for it to be distinct about your life. It doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter where you start. And so when we look at Luke 19, we see the story of Zacchaeus. And in the beginning of that story, we see that Zacchaeus is maybe just a glass of water. He's just a, a morally corrupt businessman. He's in this place where um, he's bringing... Uh, disparaging influence onto the people that he is a part of. But then what happens is he meets Jesus just as he is and something transformational takes place. Something naturally supernatural happens as he encounters Jesus and he has moved from being an immoral bus a businessman into a moral agent of change in his community. We look at the, the situation in John 8 and there's a woman who comes before Christ with her water. And she's been shamed and she's been in sin and they're wanting to stone her. But Jesus encounters her right where she's at, just as she is, in a natural moment. And supernaturally, something happens transformationally that does something in her that stands her up in dignity and puts her in a whole new standing, spiritually and societally. Transformation. In John 5, a man st starts on a mat paralyzed, laid low. Not sure why, we don't explore that, but he's laid low. He's at the temple. He can't even go into worship. And Jesus meets him at the place before even going into the place of worship. And what happens in that moment, he meets him as he is. And something transformational, supernatural happens in the naturalness of that moment. And he is able to stand up full of life, totally new, and carry the very thing that had been carrying him. He picked up his mat and walked. So my question for us here today, what's in your cup that needs transformation? And your leadership? in your life. And if there is that happening, who has the Lord placed you in connection with? What's your sphere of influence? And are they encountering the best that is yet to come? The, the fine wine that's been saved for lost? Because we get to usher people into that moment and move them out of religion and reg regulation into experiencing the celebration and the feast of what it means to live life and do life with Jesus. Amen? Amen.